Uh, we have several experts today. Uh, Dan Mitchell from uh, Cato, Congressman Steve King uh, from Iowa, uh, Steve Muirfeld from the Campaign for Liberty, Pete Sepp from the National Taxpayers Union, uh, and there are many different thoughts, several different thoughts on how we move to an improved, simpler, lower, uh, more transparent uh, tax code. Uh, and I'm rather ecumenical, I like them all. Uh, but uh, people will present both on their ideas uh, and then we'll have a conversation with the audience on how the ideas compare and maybe the politics of, okay, now that you've got a brilliant idea, how do you move it through the, the swamp known as the House, the Senate, and the White House. Uh, if we could start with Steve King, who has been a uh, proponent of the fair tax. Thanks for all for coming to CPAC and thanks for coming into this room to have this discussion and dialogue. I will tell you that um, in the conferences that we have had as a new Republican majority here in the 112th Congress, I have had heard zero visionary discussion about taxes. All we've talked about is cutting some spending and maybe actually we're about done with the discussion about tweaking the brackets. Now if we stay in that intellectual corral that we are in today, we're not going to move America forward. This dialogue is more important than any I've heard amongst ourselves at this point because we haven't had any. And it's important that we listen to everybody here and think about what's doable, but also what is visionary. And I want to talk to you about the visionary and the doable. And first, the narrative is this, that um, I think I've been for the fair tax longer than anybody I know. I was for the fair tax before there was a fair tax. And um, for me, it came to this. Uh, I, operated, started a construction business, and I was audited one too many years in a row, and that year that finally I hit the wall was uh, for, the, for the fiscal year, or actually the calendar of fiscal year for me in 1979, I was audited in 1980, that was one too many in a row, and I, and I had learned my lessons, and I, we didn't have copy machines, and I sat there, I shut my business down, and I told the auditor, you want any of my records, that's fine, they're right here in this filing cabinet, you ask for them, I'll hand you the paper, you write your notes, you hand it back to me, I'll put it in the file so I can defend myself, and then I'll give you the next paper. We did that for four days. Now, some people that know me will say that wasn't maybe the very best way to negotiate with the IRS, but I had enough, and we got done. I, they declared I owed him a bunch of money. I believe, to this day, I followed the tax laws to the letter, but when it came down to whether I was going to stand up and fight the, the full resources of the federal government and the IRS with my tiny little bit of emerging capital, it was clear to me that <coughs> my choice was stand on principle or lose your business, or stand on principle and, and lose your business, or cons make this concession, go borrow the money and try to keep the business going and pay off the loan to pay the IRS. Uh, that's where I, so I climbed, I borrowed the money and I climbed into the seat of my bulldozer, and the smoke went out the exhaust stack like it did every morning about sunrise, and it came out of my ears. And I began to think, why is the IRS in my life? Why are they making Monday morning quarterback decisions? I want rid of them. And as soon as that clicked into my mind, you don't have to think about it very long to figure out what to do. The only way you can fund the federal government uh, if you're going to abolish the IRS and the federal income tax code is to do so with a national retail sales tax on 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 consumption and on on consumption as as well. So what I've uh, what I work began to work that out. I'd sit there in the seat and work it out, and then I'd go to my Oshkosh by Gosh uh, caucus, which was a round table in the restaurant. Those guys in overalls, and they're wise people. And uh, finally, they couldn't answer my questions anymore, and they said, "Well, the reason we don't do this is this." If it were such a good idea, we would have already done it by now. <laughs> We've heard that before. No, it is a great idea. And I've turned this idea around every way you can, this Rubik's Cube of the fair tax, and looked at it from every angle. And every time I turn it again and again and again, it looks better and better and better with fewer and fewer, uh, I'll say, and maybe perhaps no weak spots in it. And so it brings me to this. We just celebrated Ronald Reagan's 100th birthday. And I was privileged to be out to Simi Valley and up to the ranch. And um, standing in his shadow, and we stand on his shoulders at the same time, he once said, what you tax, you get less of. But do you realize that the federal government does realize that? They have a first lien on all productivity in America. 
If you have earnings, savings, and investment, if you punch the time clock, if you're going to cash in for dividends or capital gains, Uncle Sam's there with our handout. Uh, when you die, Uncle Sam's there with his handout. The federal government has the first lien on all productivity in America. And what I want to do, and what many others want to do with the fair tax is, take that punishment off of the production in America and put it over on consumption. Well, you tax, you get less of, let's take the tax off of production. Let Americans produce, earn, and save, and invest all they want to, and build all the capital they want to build, and pay the taxes voluntarily when they consume for personal consumption. That's the vision. And so because we're a, you know, a bit of a narrow time frame here, and I could do this for a long time, um, I just will take you down to this, that I can hit each point of this along the way and have this discussion in the, in the <coughs> minor components of the fair tax. But it comes down to this. When, uh, when Alan Greenspan uh, stepped down as chairman of the Fed, I asked for a meeting with him downtown here in Washington in his Spartan office. It looked like it was just set up for his retirement. No books or anything in there. And we sat there in that empty office, and I tried to convince him that he should be the spokesman for the fair tax and we could move this. And I actually had a good reason to defer. He said, I need to let Ben Bernanke have his voice, kind of like a president that's retired shouldn't engage in foreign policy and step on the prerogative of his successor. All right, I respect that. So I said to him, I'm going to go down through all the things that the fair tax does, and I want you to challenge me if it can't be sustained in a debate from an economic <coughs> viewpoint. And I went down through the list. It abolishes the IRS. It abolishes personal and corporate income tax. And, and capital gains, and, and taxes on interest and dividends, and the list goes on and on. And I went through all of that, and I, and I said, can I sustain that argument, and is it all legitimate? And he said, reasonable economists will not disagree. The fair tax does all the things that you say. This is not an economic argument about the fair tax. It is a political argument, and you're the politician. He's the economist. And so as I went through the list, he said, you forgot a couple of things. The fair tax provides an incentive for savings and investment. You need to add that argument to the list that you have made and then keep saying it. So it boils down to this. The fair tax does, this is now my statement, not one that's ratified by Alan Greenspan, who may not be in as good a favor today as he was then. Um, but I will tell you that here's, here's my statement. The fair tax does everything good that anybody's tax proposal does that is good, it does them all, and it does them all better, and now we have to pass it in this Congress. Thank you.